I want to talk to you about something that I really believe has the potential and the power to change your life. On this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to talk to you about gratitude. Gratitude. How many of you, if you're like me, would just be honest enough to admit in church, you, you just find yourself complaining sometimes? You ever just get in a rut where you find yourself complaining? And is it okay to admit on Thanksgiving weekend that this weekend, even though we're supposed to be in a spirit of gratitude and giving thanks, some of us feel a little stressed out, a little bit anxious, a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit tired. Um, if that's you, I can identify. I've had a crazy, busy month. Um, I have barely slept in my own bed this whole month. I've been traveling so much. The beginning of the month, I was in uh, Ireland for a conference, and I preached at a church there, and it was wonderful. And then I had a, a family member pass away, so I had to travel for the funeral. And then, of course, we were scheduled to be out of town, visiting with my family uh, down in Louisiana this week. And I kid you not, uh, yesterday morning, I woke up, and I was actually disoriented. I wasn't even sure where I was. I was like, where am I? I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord, I'm finally back in my own bed. <laughs> like it took me a second to figure out where am I? Uh, but you know, because I've been so busy traveling this month, like my to-do list has been piling up, you know, my, my to-do list around the house and, and my to-do list for church and just my personal items. Like the other day, I got down to one pair of socks. Like I haven't even had time to do laundry. And I've been feeling just kind of a little bit stressed and complaining about it. And so here's the thing, when we face a problem or a stressful situation, there's what we need to do, and there's what we typically do. Think about what you typically do, maybe when you're feeling stressed out or you're going through a difficult season. What do you do? You find yourself maybe overeating a little too much, maybe a little ice cream therapy, anybody? Maybe drinking a little too much, telling yourself, oh, it's just one extra glass of wine at night. Maybe binge watching Netflix or scrolling social media kind of mindlessly. Or what we can begin to do is we can start just complaining about everything. Or even worse, sometimes we take out our frustrations on the people around us. And quite often people will come to me for prayer, you know, as a pastor and kind of seeking out wisdom when they're going through a, a stressful time. Like, pastor, I want to know what should I do? Like, I want to know God's will for, for my life and for my situation. And church, what if I could tell you today that I know God's will for your life? What if I could tell you that no matter wh where you're at in life right now, no matter what season of life you're in, what you're facing, what challenges you might have, like, I know how God wants you to respond and what he wants you to do. How many of you would like to know what God's will is for your life today. Anybody? All right, three of you. I'm believing for the rest of you to get on board. Well, I want to talk to you about that today. I want to show you a passage of Scripture that speaks to this very thing, and it's found in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Let me set this up for you. Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are experiencing some real challenges. They're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing marginalization and maybe even some threats to their physical well-being. And in the midst of this difficult situation, Paul writes these words, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. He says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In all circumstances, Paul? Yes. Even in persecution? Yes. When there's not, lot, not a lot, enough money in the bank account? Yes. In sickness or in health? Yes. In all circumstances, rejoice. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There you go. There's God's will for your life. Paul tells us that the antidote to our worry is to practice gratitude. Like, gratitude is not just a character trait. It's not just an emotion. Gratitude is actually a spiritual discipline. Gratitude is something that we can practice. And when you practice gratitude, you become a gracious person. Just like if you go to the gym and you work out, you get in shape. Well, guess what? In the same way, if you practice gratitude, it shapes the kind of person you become. And you end up with a gracious heart and a gracious spirit. And I don't know about you, but I want that from my life. And so what are we going to do in any situation? I don't know what your pressure points are today. I'm sure we all have the good things that, we're, that we have going on in our lives and, and the challenges that we have going on in our lives. No matter what your need or your situation is today, here's what we're going to do in any given situation. Number one, we're going to rejoice always. We're going to rejoice always. Now, the word translated rejoice comes from uh, the Greek word Cairo. The New Testament was written in Greek. And so this word comes from the Greek word Cairo, which is the same root word for the word translated 
grace, which is charis in the New Testament. So, so to rejoice and grace are very similar. In other words, to rejoice is to delight in God's grace. It's to literally to experience God's grace, his favor. It's to be conscious with his grace, to live with a sense of awareness of his grace. It's literally to rejoice is to re-grace. It's to experience his grace all over again, to experience it afresh. I love Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23. Here's what it says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Oh, I'm so thankful that God's mercies are made new every morning. How many of you are thankful for that? You ever have, ever have a day where you just need to go to bed and start all over again? Like you ever have a day that it's gone so bad that the best thing you can do is just get in bed. You're like, that's it. I've had enough of this day. Like maybe even cry yourself to sleep knowing that you're going to wake up with a fresh start the next day. I've had days like that. And I'm so thankful that when you wake up in the morning, literally his mercies are made new every day. So it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. doesn't matter how much you sinned. doesn't matter how much you messed up. doesn't matter what you did that you regret. You wake up and his mercies are made new for you for that day. Sign me up for my daily distribution of God's grace because I need it. I need it. And I love what the writer says in verse 23. He says, great is your faithfulness. In other words, I can rejoice not because of me, not because of my faithfulness, not because I'm a good person or my good deeds, but because of your faithfulness, God. See, I, I love that rejoicing isn't something forced, but it's based on the grace of God, the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, not our, our feelings, but the faithfulness of God. And this is so important because I think most people, most of us were naturally happy when things are going well, aren't we? That's just human nature. Well, most of us are happy when things are going well, when there's plenty enough money in the bank, when our health is good, when things are going well at work, when things are harmonious in our relationships. But as Christians, we know that our joy is not dependent on our circumstances. It's actually based on what Christ has already done for us. That's what Paul says. It's, done, it's based on what, what Christ has already done for us, which is unchanging, which is constant. And so that means in good or bad, I can rejoice. Whether I get a good report or a bad report from the doctor, I can rejoice. Whether finances are plentiful or my finances are tight, I can rejoice. Because circumstances change, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I can rejoice always. It's not based on my circumstances, but on who, who God is in my life. Number two, what are we going to do? In any given situation, we're going to pray continually. We're going to rejoice always. We're going to pray continually. I want to show you one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 6, 4, and then 6 through 7. Paul writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. There's the rejoice part. And then verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Some translations say be anxious for nothing, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul says we got to pray continually. Pray continually. In fact, he says, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. How many of you know that we're tempted to do the opposite? How many of you know that our human default is to do the opposite? We like to freak out about everything and pray about nothing. We tend to worry about everything, take matters into our own hands, and then we pray like as a last resort. And Paul says, you got to flip that around. You got to get things in the right order. He says, when you experience anxiety... That's actually a signal that it's time to pray. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, embrace it with prayer and petition. So when you feel anxious, it's actually a signal alerting you that it's time to pray. It's kind of like when you get a check engine light on the dashboard of your car. You ever get a check engine light on your dashboard? Like, you know, no, nobody likes to get that, right? It's like so inconvenient. Like, who has time to mess with this? But how many of you know the check engine light isn't the actual problem? The check engine light is pointing to something in your engine that needs to be addressed. You need to get car to a mechanic who can plug your car up to a diagnostic computer that can figure out what's going on with, with your engine. 
It's a signal alerting you to something that needs to be checked out. Paul is telling us in the same way, anxiety is a signal telling you that it's time to pray. It's not time to complain. It's not time to freak out. It's not time to imagine the worst case scenario. It's time to pray. And so if you're feeling a little bit anxious lately, recently, it's time to pray. P uh, Paul says in every situation, in every situation, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's on your heart, it's on the heart of Father God. If it's on your mind, it's on the mind of God, and you can take it to him in prayer. Paul says in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Oh, it's so important. You can't leave out the Thanksgiving part because that's like the secret sauce. That's what makes it all work. You see, what happens is sometimes when we pray, we end up just worrying out loud to God. You ever have a time of prayer like that? Where you go to God and just something's heavy in your heart, you're concerned about something, and you just kind of worry out loud to Him, and then when you're done praying, you don't have any peace. And don't get me wrong, God can handle your worries. God can handle it, can handle you pouring your heart out to Him. I love to read the Psalms, right? I love to read the Psalms of David, where he just pours his heart out to God, even his complaints, even his complaints against God, like, God, where were you when I needed you? Where were you? Right? When the wicked were prospering and, and I was over here struggling. Like God can handle your questions. God can handle your worries and your doubts and your complaints. But here's the thing. If you leave Thanksgiving out, you'll miss the peace. Because the Thanksgiving part is what unlocks the peace of God. You've got to do what the psalmist does. At some point in time when you read the psalms, even when the psalmist is pouring out his complaints, there's always a point in the psalm when he turns the corner and says, Yet will I trust in you, O God. And you've got to begin to remember and recount the faithfulness of God. God, I'm over here feeling anxious. God, I'm worried about the future. But God, I'm going to remember that, that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. God, you got me through in the past. You're going to get me through now. You promised to never leave me nor forsake me. God, I'm going to remember all the times you've been faithful in my life. And what happens? The peace of God which transcends all understanding begins to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I love the biblical idea of peace. It comes from the Hebrew word shalom. We tend to think of peace as the absence of difficulties, the absence of problems. And so we think, I'll have peace when all my problems go away. But shalom, the biblical idea of peace, is the presence of God. It's not the absence of anything. It's the presence of the goodness of God. And when you begin to give thanksgiving in your prayers, you invite the peace of God right into your problems so that it can transcend your circumstances. What are we going to do in any situation? What is God's will for our lives? We're going to rejoice always. We're going to pray continually. And number three, we're going to give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. You say, well, Pastor, I mean, how do we do that? Like, is that something forced, you know? Like, you can just kind of, you know, practice positive psychology. Thank you, God. I'm so thankful that I'm in Target and my child is having a complete meltdown and making me look like a bad parent. Thank you, God. You know, thank you, Laura, for this flat tire on the way to this really important meeting. Thank you that my boss just chewed me out. It was wonderful. Thank you, God. No, we're not talking about fake spirituality. We're going to give thanks in all of our circumstances because gratitude won't necessarily change your circumstances, but it'll always change you. It'll always change you. There's one constant in all of your circumstances, and that constant is you in your heart, in your mind. I heard a pastor say something years ago that has stuck with me. He said, you don't always get in life what you want, but you always get who you are. I'm going to say that to you again. You don't always get in life what you want, but you always get who you are. Think about that. Every one of us, no matter how good your life is going right now, no matter where you are, what season of life you're in, we all have things in our lives that didn't quite turn out the way we thought they would be. There's probably one thing we all have in common in this room right now. We all share some, some kind of disappointments. You know, I've been spending some time with my brothers this past week for the holidays, and, and uh, you know, we're all in, hitting middle, midlife, you know, and and most of us, we're blessed. We have a lot of good things going on in our lives. But in some way, each one of us, as I talk to my brothers, I realize we all have some area of our life that didn't quite turn out exactly like we thought it would be. You can't control what you get out of life. But you know what? You always get who you are. One of my favorite authors, Mark Batterson, he said this, if your emotions are anchored to your circumstances, they'll look like a stock chart that goes up and down daily. 
You'll have lots of bear markets and probably a crash or two. But if your emotions are anchored to the cross, it becomes your fixed point of peace. There it is, church. That's the fixed point of our peace. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's what God has already done for us. That's why we can give thanks in all circumstances. So what are we going to do? We're going to rejoice always. We're going to pray continually. We're going to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I want to give you three benefits of practicing gratitude daily. And it's so interesting that modern day psychology is confirming the ancient wisdom of the Bible. Because the writers of scripture have been telling us for thousands of years that there's something powerful about worship. There's something powerful about practicing gratitude. And psychology is catching up now. And you can just do a simple Google search and you will find so many benefits to your emotional and mental well-being by practicing gratitude daily. So I want to give you three benefits and I hope you'll take notes and this will inspire you to get into the habit of practicing gratitude. Number one, gratitude shifts your perspective. Gratitude shifts your perspective. See, many of the things that we complain about in life are actually our greatest blessings. Think about that. Many of the things that we complain about on a regular basis are actually our our greatest blessings. It's just a matter of perspective. So what do you find yourself complaining about? You don't have to answer out loud. I'll go first. One of the things I complain about the most is my house. Just, I've got three boys, you know, the house gets trampled and beat up, and we've been fixing our house up some over the years, and in the early years, it felt like we were putting it up, and the kids were tearing it down. (laughs) Just always beat up, and I should have known what I was getting into, because I'm one of four boys, and we did it to my parents, right? But something, just something's always breaking. You know, this past year we had a leak in the wall in our bathroom, had to tear it all out and, and, uh, you know, just wasn't prepared for that and hadn't budgeted for that. And thank God the Lord sent us the help that we needed. And, and, but you know, I can get in this rut where I'm complaining about things around the house. Like if one more thing breaks in this house, I'm going to take out a match and burn this place down and make it look like an accident and collect the insurance policy. I know you guys never get like that, but I get like that. I get complaining and I have these moments where The Lord rebukes me gently, and he takes me back and reminds me of when I first moved to Westchester almost 10 years ago, when I was living on a missionary budget, had to raise our salary to plant this church, and the thought of buying a house in Westchester was so far away. It was just a distant dream, and God reminds me that, come on, a lot of people would love to have your problems, Jeremy. You're complaining about your greatest blessing. See, gratitude would change your perspective would change your perspective. I actually saw a handwritten list on Facebook years ago that I saved in my files. It's, it's a reminder that the things that we normally complain about are actually our greatest blessings. I want, I want to read it to you. Can you see it? Number one, the first thing, it says, I'm grateful for early wake-ups, children to love. Number two, I'm grateful for a house to clean. How many of you find yourself complaining about chores around the house? It means I got a safe place to live. Number three, laundry. Come on. We could all complain about laundry. I have good news for you. When you get to heaven, there's going to be no laundry, okay? The angels are going to do your laundry for you. It's going to be amazing, okay? Laundry means they got clothes to wear. Number four, dishes to wash. I bet some people complain about that. It means that we got food to eat. Number five, crumbs under the table. I'm a neat freak. I'm always vacuuming. The crumbs under the table means family meals. Number six, grocery shopping means money to provide for us. Number seven, toilets to clean. How many of you just find yourself rejoicing over toilets to clean in your house? Hallelujah. It means we have indoor plumbing. And if you take that for granted, you just need to go on a good missions trip to a third world nation. And you will be so thankful for your indoor plumbing. Number eight, lots of noise. People in my life. Number nine, endless questions about homework. Kids' brains are growing. There you go, parents. Amen. The kids' brains are growing. Number 10, sore and tired in bed. I'm still alive. Amen. Isn't that a great list? It's such a good list. And here's the reality. When I'm falling into a cycle of complaining, I know it's time to practice gratitude. Pay attention. When you find yourself in a rut where you're just complaining, it's time to focus on gratitude. It always gets me focused on my blessings. It always corrects my perspective. Number two, three benefits of practicing gratitude. Number two, gratitude unlocks your worship. Gratitude unlocks your worship. See, gratitude is really the essence of worship. You know, when I was a kid, we went to church a lot. I grew up Pentecostal. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, 
Wednesday night. My parents had a Christian school. We had chapel every day. Like if going to church was like freak, racking up frequent flyer miles, I would be flying first class to heaven, okay? I mean, we spent a lot of time in church. And sometimes it felt like obligation because my parents made me go. There were a lot of Sunday nights where I didn't want to go back to church, but, but we, had, we had to go. But here's the truth. True worship isn't about obligation. It's about gratitude. See, we worship God as a response to all that he's done for us because of his love, because of his grace, because of his, his mercy. Worship isn't something that we just do on Sundays. It's actually how we live our lives. If you pay attention in the New Testament, the picture that it paints of worship is that we give our lives back to God in response to all that he did for us. He gave his one and only son for us. So in turn, the only gift that we can possibly give back to him is to live our lives for his glory. And so that is worship. It's not just something we do on Sunday morning, but it's how you talk, how you treat people, how you spend your money, how you live your life. The decisions you make are all made for the glory of God. I hope you'll see worship differently. It's not something we do one hour on Sunday morning. It's about how we live, how we give our lives back to God. Religion is about obligation. Religion says, I have to do this. Religion says, I have to pray. I have to go to church. I have to give money in the offering. I have to serve. But the gospel operates on a different principle. The gospel says I've been accepted by God through Jesus Christ. While I was yet a sinner, he gave his one and only son for me. Therefore, I get to obey. I don't have to serve God. I get to serve God. I'm like a good, loyal Chick-fil-A employee. I can say it's my pleasure to serve God. Any Chick-fil-A fans in the house? Don't you love the difference in customer service? You get a Burger King or McDonald's, they like throw your Big Mac at you. They're mad at you. They hate you. <laughs> so you go to Chick-fil-A and you say, thank you. They're like, my pleasure. Enjoy your Christian chicken. God bless you. They walk around and give you little breath mints. Come around, kind of pick up your chest. Oh, sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Guess what? It's my pleasure to serve God. I don't have to serve. I don't have to give. I get to give. I get to worship. I get to give my life back to him in light of everything that he's done for me. All right, let me put it to you this way, okay? How many of you, this will be especially for the married people who have been married for a while, okay? How many of you remember way back when you first fell in love? Some of you need to remember that. Remember what you would do for each other when you first fell in love? I remember Amy and I, we started dating in college. And I used to just dream up things I could do for her. I remember I would go to Amy's work. She was, she was working at a restaurant, and I would sit outside of her work. I'd go buy her favorite chocolate cake, and I would sit in my car and just wait for her to get out of work so I could surprise her with her favorite chocolate cake. I remember one time it was raining really heavy, and I knew Amy had a class, and I didn't want, to, I didn't want my girl to walk across campus and get soaking wet. So I drove over. I had an umbrella, and I was just waiting for Amy to get out of class. Those are the kind of things you do when you first fall up. Now she can barely get me to screw in a light bulb at the house. She's like, can you change a roll, a roll of toilet paper? Like, can I get something out of you? <laughs> but think about how things are different when you're motivated by love. I went to the Holy Land back in 2018, and I'll never forget we met a rabbi and he was teaching us about worship. And he said something that stuck with me. He said, it's not a chore to do for your beloved. It's not a chore. Sometimes we begin to think about our relationship with God that way. But, but see, gratitude unlocks your worship. It's not a chore to do for your beloved. We get to serve God. When your love for him is fresh, when your gratitude is fresh, then you recognize that we get to give our lives back to him and worship. Here's the third thing that gratitude will do for you, practicing gratitude. Gratitude reminds us that everything we have is a gift. Gratitude reminds us that everything we have is a gift. James chapter 1 verse 17 says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift is actually from your good, loving, heavenly Father. And what happens with us is that we naturally drift toward uh, thinking of everything that we have as something that we're entitled to rather than as a gift. I think our natural human tendency is to drift toward an entitlement mentality where we tell ourselves, I, I deserve this. I earn this. I work hard for this. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a certain amount of dignity that I think is appropriate that comes from hard work. There's a certain amount of appropriate pride 
to take pride in the sense of taking pride in your hard work and how it's benefited you and, and your family, but how quickly we forget how much God has blessed us, how quickly we get entitled, how quickly we see ourselves as self-made, and we forget that it's God who gave you the talents, it's God who gave you the abilities, it's God who gave you the resources, it's God who gave you uh, the open doors and your education, and maybe you had parents who helped provide for you and gave you opportunities, and we live in this country where there's so much opportunity, because if you were born in a different time, in a different place, you wouldn't have everything you have now. Can I say that to you again? I, I don't care what your, what your title is, how much money you make, where you are on the socioeconomic ladder. If you were born at a different time and place, you would have none of those things. And so we're not as self-made as we think we are. We need to be reminded that we're God-made, that it's God who has blessed us and given us so many opportunities. And I want you to think about it this way, okay? Think about the difference between receiving a gift and receiving your paycheck. How many of you... When direct deposit hits your bank account on payday, how many of you get out a notepad and a card and write your boss a thank you card to thank them for your paycheck? No, you don't do that. Why? Because you're entitled to that paycheck. You work hard for that paycheck. In fact, most of you think your boss should pay you more. If you're on staff at this church, don't say amen. I'm listening, I'm watching you. <laughs> but you're entitled to that. Now think about the difference when somebody gives you a gift. Somebody remembers your birthday, you know, and they give you a card, they give you a gift. How do you respond? Thank you. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Thank you for remembering my, my special day. Now, what if you gave someone a gift, and when you gave them that gift, they were like, thank you, because I deserve this, because I am a really good person. I'm a really nice person, and I'm entitled to this gift. What would you say? You'd say, you could take your gift, and you could shove it. <laughs> That's what you'd say, because we all understand the difference between a gift and something we're entitled to. Listen to me. You know what gratitude will do? Gratitude will shift your perspective and cause you to recognize that everything good in your life is a gift that comes from your good heavenly Father. Here's the idea, church. Practicing gratitude transforms everything in my life to a gift. It sets me free from this entitlement thing and causes me to recognize that everything in my life is a gift. And what happens is when we stray into entitlement, we actually end up holding on to everything tightly. We can live with this sense of, of, of things being taken away from us. I work for this. You know, I did this. And so we end up holding on to everything so tightly. It can even affect our joy in the good times. In fact, Dr. Brene Brown, who's a best-selling author and researcher, she calls this foreboding joy. Have you ever found yourself asking what could go wrong? Like in a season of life, it's almost like things are so good, something's about to go wrong. Anybody ever experienced that before? It's a psychological phenomenon. She calls it foreboding joy. And it's because we're not seeing life as a gift. We're so, we're so worried about losing things that we're holding onto it so tightly. What if I lost my job? What if I lost this relationship? What if I lost my health? Like my life is going too good right now. What's, going, what's happening? What's coming around the corner to mess this up? It's foreboding joy. It, it actually robs us of experiencing true joy. But when you practice gratitude daily, it reminds you that everything you have is a gift. And if it's a gift, you don't have to live in fear of it being taken away. You can live open-handed. God, you placed it into my hand. And so everything in my life is a gift. And I'm not preaching to you because I've been there before. I remember a few years ago when COVID first hit and we went into lockdown and man, churches were affected, right? We're like, we're kind of in the business of gathering people together for worship. And, and we were in lockdown and there was a sense like, is the church ever going to come back? I had some days where it was easy to be fearful that we were going to lose everything that Amy and I had poured our lives into to build, to build this church. But you know what got me through it? Moments of gratitude. You know what got me through it? Is knowing that I never took for granted a Sunday morning over in that movie theater when we started this church and people came streaming in. I would hold on to that. I would be reminded, God, everything you've done in my life is a gift from you. This beautiful church family that you gave us, this job that you gave us, this purpose that you gave us. God, it was all a gift from you. And if it all ends, if it all ends, I can say what a beautiful gift it was. And so it, it got me in the position of living like this and going through that season of recognizing, God, everything in my life is a gift. And I've told my boys many times, sitting around the dinner table, boys, you're walking around in a miracle. Because what God has done, only he could have done. Now, thank God we got through it 
and we came back stronger and better than ever before. But let me tell you something, gratitude will transform your life. And I've learned to pray every day to get up and just to begin to list the things that I'm thankful for. I've learned to just pray and thank God for the things that we normally take for granted. God, I thank you that I slept in a warm bed last night. God, I thank you for a roof over my head. God, I thank you that I took a clean shower. God, I thank you for this cup of coffee. Where are the coffee lovers at? Hallelujah for some a hot cup of coffee in the morning. God, I thank you for my family. God, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for my church family. I thank you for my health. I thank you that we have purpose in our lives. And let me tell you something, it'll change your life. It'll change your perspective. When I find myself in those ruts of complaining, I know it's time to get out and go practice some gratitude and to get out on a prayer walk and practice some gratitude because you don't always get what you want in life, but you always get who you are. Listen to me. Some of you are facing some disappointments. Some of you are going through some hurts right now. Some of you have some things in your life that really didn't turn out the way you hoped they would. Can I help you today? None of us, none of us get everything that we want in life, but you always get who you are. When you practice gratitude, it changes you. You get a gracious spirit. You get a gracious perspective. It changes the way you see life and the way you experience it, and it causes you to experience it as a gift. I want to end with this final story, and I shared this story a few months ago, but it's worth retelling. Earlier in the year, me and some of our church staff, we were down in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, spending some time with a great ministry that we partner with there called One Child. And so many of you sponsor a child through, through One Child. And we were visiting one of the local hope centers that we work with, where the children go to receive ministry. And, and they took us for a home visit. We went for a walk in the neighborhood, really tough neighborhood, just completely impoverished neighborhood. We went to go visit this grandmother who was taking care of her grandson. Uh, his mom had abandoned them and his father was working hard every day. And so she took care of her grandson. We went to her house, and her house was about the size of my kitchen. And I don't really have a big kitchen. And it was made from just scrap pieces of wood, dirt floor. The electrical work in the house was a complete fire hazard. Um, as I looked at this house, it was a complete injustice that anyone would be charging someone rent to live in this place. And the grandmother began to talk to us about her circumstances. She told us that they only have running water a few days a week and she was telling us what it was like to live there and then the interpreter as she was speaking in Spanish began to tell us that she she thanked God she began to thank God and say but we thank God that we have a roof over our heads we thank God that we're able to pay the rent here was a woman who had nothing in our eyes had nothing but she could worship like she had everything I tell you every American who was standing in that woman's house we were all convicted <laughs> I think we were all moved to tears. And let me tell you something, church, that is the power of gratitude. Gratitude will change the way you see your circumstances. It'll change the way you see your situation. Listen, we can rejoice, not because everything in our life is perfect, but because of what God has already done for us. Come on, circumstances change, but God's love, God's grace, God's mercy is unchanging. So we can give thanks in the good times, in the bad times, in good health, in bad health, whatever our financial situation, whatever things are like in our relationships at work, we can give thanks. Circumstances change, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is our source of joy. We know what He's done for us. He went to the cross for us. He's given us new life. His mercies are made new every, every morning. And so we can get up in the morning and we can rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Think about your need. Think about your pressure point. Think about what's causing you to become anxious. What are we going to do? Are we going to freak out? Are we going to worry? Are we going to imagine the worst case scenario? No, no, no. We're going to rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. We're going to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Make our request known to God in the peace of God which transcends all understanding. It's going to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So can we just take a moment to do that right now? 
right where you're sitting, just make it an altar where you can meet with God. As you bow your head for a moment, can we just begin to thank God for his goodness? God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace for a thousand different little blessings in our lives that we already took for granted today. God, we're so blessed. And Lord, today we thank you for the reminder of your goodness in our lives. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, that you came to us, that you went to the cross for our sins, that you lived a perfect sinless life on our behalf. And God, we thank you because of what Jesus did. We can say your mercies are made new every day. God, we thank you that your mercy is made new, new to us today. Lord, today we, we ask you to forgive us for the times that we've complained. Lord, we don't wanna be complainers. We wanna be people of gratitude. And so God, we're asking you to help us today, especially those who are walking through some difficult challenges that Lord, we begin to give those things over to you. And with thanksgiving, recount the faithfulness of God, your faithfulness in our lives. And may your peace, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We thank you for it. If you believe it, would you say amen in Jesus' name.